Creativity Inc. by Ed Catmull. This book chronicles the journey of Ed Catmull and Pixar, all from the early days to the current place where it is today. As with all book mind map summaries, we will focus on the lessons learned and not so much on the overall timeline and the chronicling of the events as they happened. So the book is broken down into four parts. Part one is getting started, then protecting the new, building and sustaining, and testing what we know. Getting into part one, the early days of Ed Catmull, what he, the way he started into animation was that um, when he was a little kid, he used to love the Disney animations. But a couple of key lessons early on that he learned that he wanted to explain in this, uh, in this chapter were that when faced with a challenge, we need to get smarter. And the way to get smarter is to hire or get around people who are smarter than us. And the other thing that we learned was that we need to always take a chance on the better, even if it seems threatening. Now, this is a big concept. Always take a chance on the better, even if it seems threatening, in the sense that even it seems like your chances of failure might be high or you might not succeed, we must take chance on the better. In Chapter 2, um, Ed Catmull talks about how um, George Lucas was instrumental in the early days of Pixar and uh, what he learned from George Lucas. George Lucas always took the long-term view in things, always took the long-term view. And there is a very interesting story about George Lucas where when he had successfully completed his first movie, people expected him to ask for higher money to direct the next Star Wars movie. But instead of that, he believed so strongly in Star Wars that he did not ask for higher money. Instead, he asked for merchandising rights to all of Star Wars merchandising. And he was granted that because at the time, nobody in the industry thought that that would be one of the greatest sources of revenue for Star Wars franchise. So that was a lesson that Ed Catmull took away from George Lucas to always look at the long term rather than the short term. Now into chapter three, what this book really chronicles is going on to produce the first ever animated, fully animated, computer animated movie, which was his dream. The movie was Toy Story, but he went from that to the next challenge, which was to create a creative and egalitarian culture at Pixar. Now, moving on to chapter four, which is establishing Pixar's identity. Ed talks about a few lessons he learned. Now, this is where Ed now starts talking about a lot more about how to create the creative culture and how to continue to create a creative culture and how to sustain a creative culture. And there are a few lessons learned in this chapter that you're, that, uh, um, Ed Catmull talks about. First is, he says, story is always the king, that they need to focus on story. But this is something that in a creative adventure uh, endeavor, it could be different from a movie to a creative play or uh, a scientific invention. So, But the next lesson that he talks about, which is really important, is he says, trust the process. Trust the process. But then later on, he goes on to explain why trusting the process is actually not the right thing to do. Even though we must learn to trust the process, we must also have the ability to take full responsibility for everything that is going on. So we cannot just leave everything to the process. We must trigger, design the process, trigger the process, and then be able to manage it, observe it, tweak it, fix it. We can't just assume that the process will work itself out. We must initiate and then manage the process. It's a constant, uh, it's almost like a, a problem of management where we um, plan, then we do, then we review, and then we improve. And it's the same with process. We, 
we figure out a process, we do the process, and then as we go, we try to improve, um, review the results, and we improve it. So don't just trust the process. Continue to improve the process and tweak it. And that is where one of the key ideas in this book comes in, where Ed Catmull talks about the suitcase versus the handle. Sometimes people get so lost in the big ideas, for example, trust the process, that they just take that as the holy grail. And what Ed points out is that, for example, if it's a suitcase with a handle, just the words trust the process are akin to just carrying around the handle without the suitcase below it. Key is to understand that any time we use these ideas or these simplified ideas, they are just handles and there's a lot of depth and gravity behind them, under them, which is in the suitcase. So we may we must not just carry this the handle around. We must carry the handle and the suitcase around, which means we must understand the simplified idea but also the the depth and the gravity behind it. The other lesson that Ed Catmull learned at this point was do we focus on great ideas or great people in any creative endeavor? And what they figured out was it was much better to have great people and okay ideas compared to have mediocre people with great ideas because ultimately great ideas will always come from great people. In the part two of the book, Ed talks about protecting the new and the and one of the key concepts here is the brain test, which is having as you come up with new ideas and as you create you will find that uh, there is a need to constantly solve problems and more importantly there is a need to be candid and honest with each other whereas it's not about uh, politics so it's not about my idea versus your idea or I believe this is good or this is bad but instead having a brain trust of people who get together to constantly evaluate and to um, give candid feedback, to be candid, to be open and honest and candid with the feedback that goes. Because what happens is that um, anytime a person is gets involved with a complicated project, they in inevitably get lost because they narrow down their focus and it is important to get the brain trust to get other people to get involved and to be able to give candid feedback to them so in fear and failure uh, there are this is probably one of the best parts of this book one of the things that Capital talks about is that there is no success without failure and just to expound upon it any creative endeavor, no matter how great the ultimate outcome is, it is never that great when it starts. It is messy, it is tough, and the whole idea has to go through so many iterations. It has to be worked and reworked and reworked and reworked. And anyone who believes that a creative endeavor is great right out the door is seriously mistaken. So if you're not really experiencing failures as you go along, you're making a far worse mistake because the desire to avoid failure is going to doom you to fail in the long term. And hence, we cannot be risk averse and avoid experimentation because that will be a sure short path to failure. We have to think of failure as an investment into our future, into our success. These are contrary concepts, failure and success, but um, we have to think that failure is our investment into success. And mistakes are an inevitable outcome of doing something new. So we must go out and make those mistakes as soon as possible. And that's where the next concept comes in, which is to fail fast. And this is a concept that Ed talks about, but there's something that we've also seen from a lot of different uh, people, great people in history. Um, we need to be wrong as fast as we can so that we can move forward and the key one of the concepts that Ed talks about is the idea that if you're in a battle you're faced with two hills to attack you must decide quickly and attack one of the hills the worst possible route you can take is to 
wait and try and figure out and put together a perfect plan. By the time it'll be too late. Or if you try to go from in between, in which case you will be in big trouble. So the idea is to just go forward and attack one of the hills. And a lot of times people we have this tendency to try and avoid failure by outthinking it, by trying to plan for it in various ways, but the challenge is that we are not good at predicting future, hence it is our responsibility to conduct experiments. We will inevitably fail, but the quicker we can take action and fail fast, the quicker we can learn. The other idea Ed talks about is that there are two, two parts to failure. The first is the act or the the event of failing itself, and the next is our reaction to it which is whether we give up or we fight or we get frustrated, we carry on, we learn, all those different things. So the key is it is not our job to run away from the event of failing itself. It's not our job to run away from risk, but it, our job, it is our job to build mechanisms that will help us dig ourselves out of those failures and situations when they happen to not give up but to fight, to not get frustrated but to, get, to carry on. That is our job. The next key idea in Chapter 7 that Ed Catmull talks about is the hungry beast, the ugly baby. The ugly baby is any initial new idea that needs to be protected. It needs to be protected. It needs time and care and patience. On the other hand is the hungry beast, which feeds on success in the sense that when you've had a few successes, it's constantly it constantly wants to grow and there's a hunger for more creative output so what the hungry beast does is drives deadlines and goals and urgency and with success it there is a need to be more successful and hence it drives the hungry beast the key is to understand that it's not that the beast is all bad that deadlines and goals and urgency are all bad and that the baby is all good, that we must protect the baby at all costs. The reality is somewhere in between. It is the idea that we, we have to feed the hungry beast and we have to protect the ugly baby and they both have to happen rather than do one or the other. So we have to be conflict, to, we have to be able to see conflict as essential and healthy in any creative endeavor. The conflict between the hungry beast and the ugly baby is an example of that conflict. In Change and Randomness, Ed Catmull talks about the idea that change is actually our friends because we only through struggle do we really learn and do we get clarity and there is no growth or success in a creative endeavor without change. So we have to push ourselves beyond our boundaries. The challenge is that once you master a system, you become blind to its flaws, and hence you start considering change unnecessary. But that is the key. We must push for change. We must push ourselves beyond our comfort zones. We must push ourselves because that change is what will give us clarity. Now, the idea of randomness is that it says randomness is a part of success. And it is tough to comprehend because our brain is always looking for patterns. But one of the one of the mathematical stat statistical ideas that Ed talks about is stochastic self-similarity, in the sense that uh, there are self-similar processes that behave the same when viewed at different degrees of magnifications or different scales on a dimension of space or time. Now that sounds very uh, technical, but if you were to just simplify it, for example we can have problems on various scales like losing a shoe or having a car wreck or a terrorist attack but all these problems must be approached with the same set of values and emotions and we almost do but the key is to understand that no matter how big a problem it is still a problem and the emotions and the values that we place the values that we use to resolve those problems will be similar and hence it allows us to get a certain level of perspective and uh, um, in in face of great challenges in the in the chapter on hidden what at points out is that we all 
are blind to our own blind spots. We have limited ability to see possible problems because we have a very limited view of our past. Our memory is selective and we cannot depend on our memory and be able to understand problems. We should use the past as a teacher rather than as a fixed guide. One of the concepts that is well known now is the confirmation bias, that we prefer information that confirms our pre-existing beliefs, whether true or not. And hence, we are blind to our own blind spots. And the key here is to understand that our mental models are not the reality, but the tools through which we explore reality. Our mental models are in some ways limited. Another idea that I talks about is the door metaphor, which is on one side of the door is everything known and on the other side of the door is everything unknown, unsolved problems, unrealized potentials, possibilities. And the key is to keep the door open on both sides, to put one foot on either side of the door and to be able to get into the hidden realm, to be able to understand that the hidden is absolutely necessary to creative process and without venturing into it there is no future creation. So the door metaphor is a really simple way to remember and understand that we must always be aware of the hidden and be a try to um, use it. In part three of the book which is about building and sustaining the chapter on broadening our view talks about the challenges that come as a inevitably in a creative endeavor is one of the challenges is that our models of the world distort the way we see the world and we don't see the boundary between new information coming in and our old established models of thinking the other challenge is that people, when they work together and they live together, their models of the world become intertwined and hence they become limited. And also that we become inflexible. Now, Ed talks about various solutions to these. I want to touch on, we'll touch on three of those key solutions. One of them is the power of limits. The power of limits. Where the key understanding is that... Um, we must be able to set useful limits and impose them rather than l having no limits because a limit implies that we can't do everything and we must employ smarter ways to do something. So we must not over-engineer stuff. We must not try to do everything. We must do what is the most important. The other solution that it talks about is being able learning to see not just and that is something that comes very clear from art because it's not an art class is not necessarily about learning to draw but it is about learning to see our brain uses preconceptions to simplify and it prevents us from seeing and some of the techniques that an artist uses is being able to outline the negative space and also inverting the object which makes our brain lose those preconceptions that it has. Uh, one of the I interesting ideas that Ed presents here is that focusing on something can make it more difficult to see. Fascinating idea in some ways because when we focus on something too much we're unable to see around it but sometimes we need to be able to defocus and look at the environment around to get a better view of what we're trying to get to, to get to better solution. We need to not get caught up in the problems and be able, we need to be able to look elsewhere for solutions. That is why we need to be able to learn to see rather than just use our preconceived notions of what is. And the other idea that talks, that Ed talks about uh, one of the other solutions is the ability to continue to learn, to never believe that we have arrived, to never think that this is it. One of the dangers of being successful is that we abandon the beginner's mind and 
we attempt to avoid failures because we think we know everything and we don't need to learn anything new and that is where we start failing so in order to advance we must let go of our preconceived notion that we know everything and we must continue to learn in the unmade future Ed talks about how the future is yet to be known and it is our job as cre in creative endeavors to um, figure it out. Now, one of the key concepts that Ed talks about is that there is the struggle involved. Creativity is a process full of struggle and it's more like a marathon than a sprint. And as you keep working, the project reveals itself to you. But the key is to never stop moving. That is probably the biggest takeaway in this lesson which is to never stop moving because when you move when you stop moving you panic and the job of the leader is to commit to a destination and drive towards it it is to make a guess and to hurry up and implement rather than wait and try to figure out the best course of action the next idea is the flow state that we need to be in the zone not overthinking but flowing with it and one of the examples that Ed gives is of one of his directors who thinks of directing like skiing because when he tries to avoid crashing when he tries really hard to not to crash is when he crash crashes most often so he needs to be in the zone and just go with the flow rather than overthink the whole thing the other idea that Ed talks about is the sweet spot that there is the sweet spot between the known and the unknown and we have to let it be we have to be able to learn to lean into it rather than um, try to go one way or the other and there are two two kind of paradigms here one is that we create the future and we should be able to predict the future but the other idea is that we don't have a clear vision of what it would look like in the end and people don't have a clear vision of the future and we must keep on iterating we must keep on moving the uh, the other big idea in this chapter is mindfulness that ha being mindful allows us to lean into the future to to be able to resolve problems easily not to suppress the problems but to become present to them and see them for what they are because this allows us to become more mindful and creative in our future unmade endeavors. In part four, testing what we know, chapter talks about how in 2006 Pixar was sold to Disney and they had to run through various merger related challenges. Um, but the key concepts are in chapter 13 where it's, uh, it's about notes day and the way the leadership team figured out a way to solve the challenges facing them. The solution that they came up was to ask all the people, all the staff, to come up with solutions to the problems that they were, to bring the problem to everyone and let them solve it, rather than try to let the executives or the leaders solve it. And Ed closes with a very big idea which is nothing in this book or nothing will really make the creative process easier because easy is not the goal excellence is and challenges never cease failures cannot be avoided and our vision is often an illusion so we must keep on moving and the goal is not to say that we have it figured out but to continue to figure out we will always have problems and we must not be afraid of those challenges and uncertainty. We must keep on moving. So that concludes Ed Catmull's Creativity Inc.